Great. So, Don, can you hear me and do you want to go ahead and get started? I am ready. Thank you very much. Okay, everyone. So, as um, Aaron told you, I'm Don Marston. I'm the Director of Projects with the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs. And as many of you, can anybody, how can that so small, Aaron? What was that, Don? The screen. Is anybody seeing the other? I'm not getting the slide. Oh, there it is. Never mind my computer and this. And I'm away from Aaron. I'm in a totally different space. So you all, if I ask Aaron questions because the technology is beyond my capacity, please. Everything's with... looking good to me on my end, Don. Excellent. Thank you. So I have been with um, WASPIC for eight years now. I started in 2006. October, uh, August of 2006 to implement the statewide victim information and notification program, which we call SAVIN. Many of you know that program. Um, that was implemented in this state um, the end of 2006. When we implemented that program, it was through federal funds, and part of the federal funds required matching funds. We were able to get matching funds through the state legislature and actually ended up with more than we needed. That additional dollars allowed us to, to purchase what was called the, they call it DPO, Vine Protective Order. We call it Savin Protective Order Program at that time. So we are one of only about eight or nine states that even have this particular program. It is still new. It is still growing and developing. Um, it has great potential, I believe, but we want to make sure that people know how it works and what the downsides might be, the upsides may be. And so, again, I appreciate your time and your interest in this topic today. And I hope you can all hear me just fine. So we have plenty of time. Please ask questions. I will try to be as thorough as I can. Many of you have heard parts of this as I've gone around the state to do trainings about this program and the victim notification program, um, the offender, uh, offender Watch, the Sex Offender Program. That's a more in-depth program. I can show you right on the website how everything works. There's no cost to you or your agency. So if you want more in the future, just let me know, and I'll be glad to come and do that for you. So today, um, again, let me talk about these names because it is confusing. It is hard to remember that um, what exactly what we're talking about. The program Vine, the Victim Information Notification Every Day, that is Vine, is a copyrighted product um, from a small company in Louisville, Kentucky called APRIS. They're the ones who created it in 1994 as a result of a stalking murder that they had in that community, and the offender was released from jail. Um, the victim was told she would be notified and wasn't and was murdered on her 21st birthday. So they created an electronic system at the time using just the telephone. Now it's all, you can still use the phone, but it's all on the Internet and much easier and much faster to navigate. When they had that program started in 1994 and started marketing it around the United States, in about 2001, the Department of Justice through um, in their Bureau of Justice Assistance said this is a great project and we should provide funds to states to implement the program. However, because it was the federal government, they don't allow you to use or they don't endorse a copyrighted product. So any state who received federal funding to uh, implement a victim information and notification program had to call it something besides Vine. The federal government calls it the Statewide Automated Victim Information Notification, SAVIN. Some folks in D.C. pronounce that SAVIN, Missouri, um, calls it Movan, Louisiana calls it Laven, has different names. It is all exactly the same thing, but it has caused a lot of confusion. You go to the website, it's called Vine Link. Um, you don't see Savin very often. 
So I just wanted to, again, to clarify that information about the name. So if we say Savin or Vine, they're the same thing. Savin PO, Vine PO, VPO are all the same thing. It is the program, um, again, that was created after the victim information notification, but it was created specifically to try to address the lethality of protective order service. The research shows that the first 24 hours after a protective order has been served are the most lethal hours. And so is there a way, excuse me, is there a way that petitioners can be notified that their protective order has been served so that they can take some further um, safety steps? That's a great goal. Um, we found out, and almost every state found out, it doesn't work quite as simply as that, but that is still the goal. Also, the program is talking about any kind of protective order. It really is a generic term. In this state, as you know, we have um, protective orders, anti harassment orders, sexual assault protective orders, stalking protective orders, criminal you know, contact orders. We have a variety of things that fit in that category. I was in a meeting with a phone com conference with all of the other states that have this particular program, and I had some questions specifically about how do we um, navigate all of our crazy, all of these protective orders, and what can we do to make this better? And I just have to tell you, every single state was fairly horrified um, because there was not a state that had more than two kinds of orders. So they just couldn't even wrap their heads around um, all of the things that we have going in this state. And I'll talk more about that later, but it has just been an interesting dynamic. The thing to know is that the information on protective orders comes directly from the Washington State Patrol database. So every kind of order is enter entered into that database and it, the information is pulled from there. So it doesn't matter what kind it is. To find out about these protective order programs, we have a couple of ways that you can do that. First of all, the information is on the regular victim notification program called vinelink.com. And then you click on the statewide information. Most of you know that in this state, Every county and city jail, virtually, there's a couple missing, are on the victim notification program, the statewide victim notification program. But King County purchased this program on their own with their domestic violence dollars in um, 1999, so about eight years before the statewide system was in place. And so when you're searching for something, you search the statewide, but you also search King County specifically. When you go, when you search on the statewide, there is an information page. I'm going to show you this in just the next slide, but let me explain it. An information page that has information about the victim notification program and about the protective order program. It also has a box where you can click on to find offenders or you can click on to find um, protective orders. If you click on that protective order box, it takes you right to the register VPO, register your um, seven protective order. It takes you to that site directly from that link. If you go to King, the King County Jail site, you can still register your protective orders there, but they just have a link directly to this site. They don't have the other tab. So just wanted to clarify that. It's not that you can't use this for King County. You absolutely can. Um, you just have to get to it slightly differently. To register for um, custody status, which is jail status, you just go to vinelink.com only. If you want to register your protective order, you can do it through the vinelink.com or you can go directly to registervpo.com. It doesn't matter which way you go. This is a very bad screenshot, and again, um, because we're doing it this way and I can't get you right to the web page, you're going to have to go look at it. But there's a couple of things let me just point out to you so you'll know what to look for when, you, when you're there. 
one of the things to notice when you get to that page up here in the corner will be a box that says Espanol, and so if you want all of this information in Spanish, you just click on to that corner. There's information about the victim notification program is up here, and the information about the protective order information down here. Here is the link to offenders. Here's the link to protective orders. The protective order notification is slightly different than the um, offender notification or the custody status notification. Those of you that are used to that program know that the message comes and says, this is to let you know that this person has been released or transferred or whatever um, from this jail. Please enter your PIN number followed by the pound sign to let the system know that you received the message and then it turns it off. For some added protections in the protective order notification program, the message says, we have the information that you have requested, enter your PIN number. So you have to remember your PIN number in order to get that message that the protective order has been served. If you forget your, protect, your PIN number or if you um, change your telephone or whatever, you can make changes right online to that PIN number. But it's really important when you're working with petitioners to remind them that this has got to be a PIN number they can remember. There is some other information on here I'm just going to point out to you. There is the victim notification brochure in English and Spanish here. There is also the protective order uh, notification just in English here if you want to look at just that brochure to get more information. I'll talk about that a little bit later too. The other thing on this page that's important to notice is right down here, and this is just for the custody status notification. If a jail is changing booking systems or their computer is broken or they're um, updating their server or whatever and the information is not flowing, that will show up right here and so you can't register at that particular moment. This happens almost never for the protective order notification program because it's one site. It is just the Washington State Patrol database. In the two years that it has been functioning, or three years, functioning really well, it has been down only once for a matter of about a day. So it is a very stable program. The other quick new piece of information for those of you that don't know, the offender status program can now be also on your phone. Um, it is not a text message, but you can go to the app store and download Vine Mobile and do all your searching on your phone, so just for your information about that. Okay. Is there a benefit or a difference? For um, the difference between registering a protective order and signing up with Vine Link. Vine Link if you're doing the offender notification, that is jail custody status and DOC custody status, so very, very different. However, many of your folks who have protective orders, um, it's very likely that the offender um, or the respondent is in custody at that moment, and so they may want to register for the offender change in custody status so they know when that person gets out of jail, just to have that information. Then you would register for the protective order notification because that's going to tell you if they are not in custody or the, it's not a criminal no contact order that's usually served in court, that they will be told when that notice has been served by law enforcement. It's not going to be within that 15 minutes like you get for jail custody status, and we'll talk about that, but they will find out, they will know that the order has been served when they go back to court and they, and the judge says, has it been served? You can say, yes, I received notification that it has been served, okay? Um, I see some questions are coming in, but I know that uh, Aaron is going to keep track of the ones that I don't talk about as we move through, through here today. We'll go back and pick those up. I don't know why I'm getting this. Okay. 
So this is just a, a reminder about the jail notification comes within 15 minutes. It's a public website. It's available to anybody. On the protective order website, you have to have the protective order number, the respondent's first and last name, and the county in which it was issued. So it's much more closed and it's not an open public website. All right, so this is where it gets just a little um, convoluted in this state, I think. And we keep talking about it, and someday maybe we can get all of this resolved. But this is the way it is right now. So if we have a petitioner who gets a protective order from the courts, whether that's civil or criminal, and again, criminal is a little bit different because you usually do know when it's been issued if the person's in court that day, but if not, um, the court sends a copy of that or hand delivers or faxes or emails, it's a variety of ways, a copy of that order um, to law enforcement, to, to the jurisdiction where um, that order is to be served. Law enforcement enters that information into the Washington State Patrol database. So that is one of our first delays. How long does it take from the time you have the order from the courts until it gets entered into the database. It says it should be within X number of days, within three days. It can be within three hours, but you need to check with your community to find out exactly for what the time frame for all of this is. Then law enforcement serves that protective order, and then they come back and the service information is entered into the Washington State Patrol database. Again, that can range from anywhere from one minute to three days afterwards. And as community-based advocates, find out and say, can we make this better? How do we make this better? In some communities, law enforcement will immediately call dispatch to enter that service information into the database, and it's right there. In other communities, they may um, wait till the end of their shift take it back to their office. It's entered um, by the clerks in the office. If it's Friday afternoon at 515, that might not go in until Monday morning. What is real in your community? As I've talked to uh, DV advocates about this program and about not being able to say it, it is a safety feature for that first 24 hours because we don't know when that information is entered. They said it's still a vital program just to let the petitioner know it has been served, but sometimes it's just hard to find that out. The other thing about this is it, uh, using this program not only cuts down the number of phone calls that the people in the courts or law enforcement or whomever get about has it been served yet, you'll probably know even before them. It goes very quickly that way. Once it's been entered into the Washington State database, the notification information goes out within an hour of that entry. That can be faster. Um, right now, there's just not enough, and they come in about once an hour into that database. So the two systems work um, basically the same way. They pull the data the same way. The difference certainly is in the length of time that it takes to receive that information. And again, check with your local law enforcement to find out how they do that. There are some ways to shortcut this. There's a way for law enforcement to enter the information straight into the um, SAVIN database and get that information out sooner. There are um, ways to get more information into the system, but a lot of that just requires some changes in the ways that we do things in this state. Okay. Are we okay down here with questions? I'll just keep going. I don't see. Oops. Okay, the numbers. Just We have a lot of protective orders in this state, and so I just took a three-month period from June 1st to the end of August. The total number of orders in the Washington State database was over 14,000. Um, of that 14,418 were sexual assault orders, 
um, over 3,000 per permanent protective orders, there's criminal no contact orders. Then I went and looked to see how many people went to the seven protect website during that same period of time. There were 1,700 visits to that site. But you will notice that there's only 164 active registrations during that period of time, or active registrations right at this minute. So one of the interesting things to me is we've talked about this program um, over the last couple of years is that the number of people reg registering to receive notification has grown slowly, Oops, steady but very slow. However, once we got so that we had to get to the website online, the number of hits to that website has just grown very quickly. And so part of my wondering is for protective orders and people who are anxious about their protective orders, I'm just wondering if they feel more comfortable going in every single day and verifying the information on the protective order or checking it out or even hourly rather than waiting for a phone call or an email message um, maybe that's just part of that needing to take care of myself. So those of you who work with petitioners and work with these issues, if you can get some anecdotal information about that, it would be very helpful as we move forward with this particular program. So during those nine months, there are actually a total number of notifications of 390. 222 of those were phone notifications and 168 were email notifications. There's no way for us to know if people duplicate, you know, if I want a phone and an email message, um, multiple messages, but at least we see that it's working and the information is going out. Okay. I've got to remember to double click. There we go. All right. So there's a couple of things um, before I get, well, maybe I'll save some of that. So what we can do to assist. One of the things that has been difficult is to get this information out. And as most of you know, most, the vast majority of folks who get at least civil protective orders do it on their own without an advocate. So how do we get information to people who may not be going through a community-based program or through the victim witness folks or whomever? If I finally was able to get to the court clerk's conference earlier this year and was telling them about this program, and they were actually very interested in it, um, because, you know, they have tons to do and adding to their workload is very difficult. But this particular program will save them so much time in answering phones that um, I said, you know, how can, we, how can we add this information to the documents that you already give out? And we talked about it quite a bit. As I told you, there is a brochure that gives um, good information. We have that brochure in English and in Spanish. And there's quite a bit of information in there. They thought it was too much, to be perfectly frank. They thought that we should have something that was very quick, very simple, that people getting protective orders have so much information and so much documentation that it was fairly overwhelming. So I'm going to pop to this next slide. I'll come back to this one in just a minute. So they asked that we create a very simple little form. This thing right here is about the size of a two by three. I'm not even sure it's quite that big. We asked them to try to make it about business card size. It's a little bit bigger than that. It's on what's called a tear sheet, you know, where you just tear a piece of paper off and you hand it. It is on the front side or on one side is English. On the other side, it's in Spanish. I just received a ton of these, box loads of them. There's about 25 per pad. 
So again, there'll be contact information at the end. These are brand new, no one has seen them yet. So if you just send me your mailing address, I'll be able to, to send you a great big package of them. And again, no cost to you. So these might be a much easier way to, to hand out that information to have people at least know to go to the Register VPO site and just to check on their, the status of the protective order just as they do um, the custody status information. Okay. So that is number one. And again, the brochures and the tear sheets are in English and in Spanish. Um, you can also download the brochure on the web pages I showed you, but I think it's only the English version there. Help um, petitioners register or pre-register for notification. All that is needed is the protective order number, the respondent's first and last name as they appear on the order and the county of issuance. I'm going to talk about this, uh, these items just a little bit more. First of all, we are discovering that when people go to check on their protective orders or to register, the system says they can't find it. And almost always, it's because the name they are entering is not the same name that is on the protective order itself. For example, it might be that, that someone has been called Tom forever, and that really is a middle name. And so if I were to enter Tom Smith rather than John Smith, because that's his um, given first name, they're not going to be able to find it and be able to connect. We have talked to APRIS, the company that has created this, and said, do we really have to have the respondent's first and last name? Could they search just by protective order and just by the county in which it was issued? They are researching that and trying to look at if, if there's a way to simplify that so, a little bit. So an important thing as you work with folks is that the, you have to know what the name is and how it's spelled on the protective order itself. The other piece that is brand new um, for the most part is called pre-registration. This is something that has been available uh, to folks and one of the reasons I bring this up is because if you get a protective order, if I get a protective order right now and I rush home and I jump on my computer to register it to be notified, if law enforcement hasn't entered it into the system yet, there's nothing to register against. The system doesn't know it's there. And so sometimes, because I told you that can take up to three days, then the petitioner kind of forgets about it. Um, and then it's not done. So we were trying to find a way that you could pre-register your notification that the system would hold it until the protective order itself got entered into the Washington State Patrol database. Up until uh, last month, in order to do that, a petitioner would have to call the Vine operator, which is um, that number right there, would have to call, talk to an operator, and the operator would enter the information in what was called a pre-registration format. They still haven't figured out how to let every petitioner do that pre-enter if you don't call um, an ad or the operator. But what we can do is we can set up now um, community-based advocates, maybe an identified one or two people. This is a, you know, a very sensitive database. We don't want to give access to everyone. But if your agency has a legal advocate or somebody who works specifically with, with protective orders, they could actually become the pre-register agent and could go into the back office of this system and pre-register for notification. So as you think about that, want more information about that or are interested in that, 
uh, be sure to let me know and I will walk you through it and we'll talk about it. So it's just, again, it's not wide open, but, and we would give you information just for your particular county. So I'm sure there'll be more questions about that, but type them in or just call me. So that is that piece. We already did that one. Let's go down here. Um, if you were to have access to this database, and as I told you, when I go in, the first thing I see are unmatched pre-registrations. And this is a little bit disconcerting to me because uh, they're there. That means that the, somebody called the operator, they entered in their protective order, they entered in the case number, the respondent's name, their own email or phone number. I took that information out and the county in which it was issued. These are just from those one month period, um, this number were never entered or didn't match. So there's two issues going on. It could be that they didn't get entered from law enforcement for whatever reason, and that would be an important thing to find out. Or it just may be that, again, that the pre-registration was such that um, the names are wrong and it just didn't match up. So this is an important page as we start doing more and more advocacy work around this issue to figure out what's happening with the unmatched pre-registrations. Don, do you see the question, there's someone asking, if someone pre-registers, does someone still need to go in and complete the registration once law enforcement enters the order or does it automatically kick over? It'll automatically kick over. That's a great question. I'm sorry, they're so small on my screen, the questions I can't see them. So let's just stop for a minute and let's um, do some of these oral questions. So yes, if you're pre-registered, it's just like you're registered and the system will just automatically match it once it's entered. There was another a question earlier, Don, that says, to register the protection order, is this when the client gets a copy of the protection order? that has been filed with the court? And is this uh, is this for the temporary protection order as well? It can be for any of the protective orders. So it can be a temporary order. It can be a permanent order. Um, there are some, you know, I know in King County, for example, for a long time, there are a lot of the temporary orders that didn't get in because there was just such a volume. When I go check it now, it looks like there's a lot of temporary orders in there, so I'm getting it. But it has, it, they all go in whenever law enforcement receives them. Great. Does that answer that question, whoever asked it? I will make sure I will ask. Um, okay. I don't see any other questions right now. Okay. Oh, thanks, Martha. All righty. So anyway, the, this unmatched pre-registration thing is always is concerning to me, and it's one of the things that we would really like to address. Okay. All right, here's some things to know. First of all, let me back up just a minute and let you know that when I told you that we got funding from the state for the victim notification program related to jail and prison custody status, under the SAVIN program, and that money is still um, in place. That program is still being paid for through uh, general funds, mostly general funds from the state budget. So what was it, four years ago or so when the world, the financial world collapsed and we needed to cut back, um, all of us, every state agency or state dollars had to take a cut, and for WASPIC one is that we had um, a certain amount we had to reach. And so the decision was made actually to cut the protective order notification program because it was still very, very new. We had maybe 20 people registered at that time. So it wasn't being used. It seemed like something that we could eliminate without seriously impacting things. When we did that, APRIS actually came to our rescue and said, no, we want to see how this program continues to grow. Um, we will reduce the amount of money that it costs you 
Um, we will connect you to the Mary Byron Foundation that is working on protective orders to get some bridge funding while we found additional funding. And so we actually have been keeping this program going for these last three years. Last year, um, we worked with the Office of Crime Victim Advocacy and were able to get federal funds for this program through the grants to encourage arrest. That funding is for a total of three years. So we have two more years on that particular funding. One of the requirements for that funding or one of the deliverables is actually doing these kinds of webinars so that we get the information out with the goal of all of that being to expand the program and to see if it grows and develops and um, uh, to see if we get a sense of its value. I see it growing. I see it developing. We still have two years to do that, but obviously one of the things that um, we will be looking at is how are we going to fund it after these two years. Can we expend the grant to encourage arrest money? And I think if the numbers are there and, and it shows that it's becoming a viable program, obviously uh, makes much more sense to go after funding. If it doesn't look like it's going to grow or develop after these three years, then, um, then we'll have to go to Plan B or we'll just eliminate it. Who knows? So one of the things that we ask is that you just spread the word. However you do that, can you work with your court clerks? Can you work with the advocacy program? Can you make sure that everybody has the brochures or the tear sheets in English and Spanish? Do people know about it? Are you working with your law enforcement folks to say, all right, are you getting the information in very quickly? Or how can we do it more quickly? Or we're noticing that it's not getting it in at all. What does that look like? And as you all are, for whatever reason, is tracking legislative session and protecting victim services funding. And that's exactly what this is and the SAVIN program is victim services funding. Um, you probably all know that the, the state Supreme Court case, I never remember the name of the case, but some of you do, um, has said that, that the state needs to pay money back to the schools. And so we're already going to be taking a cut, budget cuts probably, and so everybody needs to be paying attention. So yes, uh, Natalie, there is a mechanism in the service to notify. There is a place to check in there that uh, firearms have been, are involved. And that's sort of in the back office part of this. It is not, it's not really been used in this state. The thing to know and the thing that during the legislative session, and maybe we can do this as a different kind of training at some point, I'm showing you sort of the, some of the public information, but again, that back office, all of the data from the database and what's in the Washington State Patrol and the reports that we can do, and the things that this program can do are pretty amazing. You could have the protective order form right in the program, fill it out right online, it can, um, some states actually because they have a centralized court system can send out court notice notifications. You know, your hearing is scheduled for this day or there's been a change in your hearing. There's lots of things the program itself can do and one of the things the program can do is to track sort of this firearm surrender. Um, I don't know that it's the mechanism that counties or whomever are choosing to do that, but it is a possibility. So I hope that answers that particular question. Okay. All right. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize it was here already. So um, here's my contact information. Again, anything else that you have? I need to go, let me just go through over here on my own piece of paper and make sure that I've covered everything that I want to cover, but then we can also take time for any questions that you might have. One of the things, uh, hold on, review percent and explain tear sheets, I did that, Spanish is on the back, you all know that, pre-registration issues. 
Yeah, yeah and Don, as you're looking through your notes, if people want to think about any questions they have around the protective order system or SAVIN, um, think about those and put them in the chat, and we have enough time to cover those for exactly. sure. Yeah. So I thought I had one more slide. So I'm trying to think of what else that I want. I wish that we had had, um, and I think we'll set this up differently next time, where we sort of have the capacity for me to show you the program right online. I know it slows down um, sort of the movement of the slides, and we didn't want to do it this time. But the whole program that they've created or the product that they created has a lot of elements that we are not using in this state. What we are using are the notification that it has been served, and that is a, a great benefit to petitioners just to have that peace of mind that, yes, I at least know he, he or she has that order. The other thing it does, and we just changed this a little bit recently, is it also now sends out a 90-day in advance notice that the protective order is about to expire. Initially, that was just a phone call and it was a 30-day advance. Um, the court clerks had said 30 days is really not enough time. So we have backed that so it comes out 90 days in advance. And again, the petitioner can register to receive that notification either on phone or an email or both. Um, it's not there right now. Is there any political will around modernizing? <laughs> you know, I just have to tell you, there is a lot of um, political um, will. Son, I'm, I'm just going to interrupt you real quick so everyone oh, sure. can ask a question because I think that not everyone can see it. Oh, I'm so sorry. So I will ask it. Is there any political will around modernizing the service process, like having a scanning feature to show something has been served, like package delivery, versus having to physically transport the return of service form? There have been, oh, I don't know, a dozen meetings in the last couple of years about the protective order system in the state and how it works and how it is convoluted, I think. Um, some counties have been trying to do things on their own to streamline what's happening in their county. King County has done some amazing work to uh, at least try to, to make sense of the way things are done and to make sure that things are being tracked better. I don't know who has the clout to take it to the level that it needs to do because it would be a massive overhaul. I think there is a lot of interest. I think it, it is uh, an amazingly big project. So again, I think starting in your communities and trying to make things work as best they can. A lot of uh, counties are now starting to do everything electronically, so that certainly can be done. Um, I think things are happening at those smaller levels than, than a gigantic overhaul. Okay, so uh, Elisa, yes, to get those brochures, to get the brochures or the tear sheets or handouts or anything that you might need, just send an email to me um, with the mailing address and what you need, and I'll be glad to mail that right out. So Don, you, this is Kelly, you were mentioning um, briefly what people could do in their communities, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what kind of system advocacy you would recommend advocates be doing in their communities around this system. Oh, I think that's a great question. Thank you. So, um, you know, I'm a firm believer in the power of um, advocacy in the communities, and one of the things I know that the systems-based, so you, you did say, Kelly, systems-based advocates, right? Um, actually, I was just referring to system advocacy in general, but would, however you would like to spin that is fine. I think. Um, All right, system right, advocate. I get it. So yeah. again, system-based advocates. Really, one of the great things we can do is to make sure that the information is available and being given out um, through the courts or with the people that you are meeting with. Again, the same as any other advocate on how to do that and to get that information out. Um, and I think 
I think sometimes internally it works better from that internal to be able to get to the court people and say, you know, can we at least add this little tear sheet to the other to the materials that are already going out, or can we add these brochures, or can we have this information? Um, one county is looking at putting the computers that they have for protect workers computers in their lobbies, and they're making sure that people know they can go right to that computer and register their um, protective orders. Again, that's why we want to increase the pre-registration piece. I think that the systems advocates particularly would make great contacts for pre-registration, um, again, because of uh, their location and there's a limited number of folks, we can give them access to the information in their county. They can go in and see how many protective orders are in their county. They can see how many folks have registered, can look at the percentages of those, um, can, do, can do that pre-registration for folks, have a, an easy way to be able to handle that. So one of the states, by the way, that was on the conference call with me has two different kinds of orders. And so for their protective orders, particularly, there is a, a agency that, I think it's a, I think it's just a community-based agency, but a statewide agency that is charged with um, doing the notification, the protective order notification. And because they only have two kinds of orders, she actually gets a list of every single person who's gotten a protective order and makes direct contact to have that person register. So they have 50% of um, their petitioners are registered for notification. So that's the difference when you saw the percentage that we have, which is about one. Um, she has 50%. I don't know that we want to do it her way, but again, it's how do we look at our process and how can we um, assist with getting the registration done. The other piece, and I need to go backwards just a step on the, uh, on the custody status notification program, the Savin or Vine program that you all know about really well. We have, again, been pretty consistent with the slow growth of the use of that program. And we recently found, in the last two months, three months, that jails now, the county jails that have a published jail roster can add a link to that person who's in custody that automatically, if you click on the link, takes them to the victim notification program right to that page where they register. So in Thurston County, for example, they averaged 45 new registrations a month. The very next month when they implemented the direct link, they had 270. It just shows how many people monitor things that don't have contact with victim advocates. So again, how do we get the word out to everybody? Pallets County just did it last week, and they went from 14 to 65 in one week. So it's, it's getting the word out in a broader way than we often are used to. That was a long-winded answer. I hope that helped. How do we get someone at our agency set up to choose a pre-registration process? That is a great question, and thank you for asking. So you have to contact me, and I will... Um, I can just set them up. It's a very simple process, but what I'm trying to see, what I want to make sure that we do is that we have verification that this person um, should have access to the, sort of this information. And so whether it comes from your agency director or the um, advocate coordinator person or somebody who says, yes, would you please register this person to be our primary protective order service person, and we can set that up. And again, we set it up so you have access just to the information in your county. Does that answer that, I hope? And again, please call me or email me or whatever, and I will get more information to you as I can. Are there, Are there any other questions?
Okay, it looks like people have asked the questions they need to ask, and we're at the end here. Don, thank you so much. It has been great and really informative, and I really appreciate you breaking down each of the steps so that people know what to do. It's very active. I appreciate that. Yeah, and Don has her um, contact information, I believe, on the previous slide, and hopefully and you want me to put it back. That'd be great, just so we've got that up there for the wrap-up. Perfect. So that's Don's contact information, um, and we just want to make sure everyone on the webinar is aware as well um, that everyone at WICFAP is available also to help you um, and assist you with any advocacy questions that you have related to this or anything else. Um, and I think Erin's yeah. going to wrap us up. Yeah. There's not much more to say because we really appreciate you all being on this call with us. Again, you're going to receive an email and it'll have an evaluation in it. Please take the time to do that. If you had multiple people on one call um, that were not registered, just listening in or looking at the slides, then we would really appreciate it if you email us their names so we have accurate attendance records. It's very helpful for us. Um, I don't think there's anything else to add. Don, again, thank you for being with us today and for all of the work that you do and for all of the preparation for this. We really appreciate it. And Thanks. we will do it attended. I appreciate your interest and however um, you can assist, I think it's great. And please let me know if you need more information or if you'd like me to come to your community and do a two-hour training of all of the things, but we also include law enforcement and prosecutor's office and courts, and we can get everybody in the same room. And sometimes that really helps to have everybody there to say, okay, how does it work in this in this community, and how can we make it better? Um, so I'd be glad to help facilitate that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, and thanks, everyone. And email us if you have any questions. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Please stand by.